followers until the day of judgment. Respected viewers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to contemplate again on the contemplation of the glorious Quran. I need to address this particular topic because it's so significant. If we need to benefit from the glorious Quran, we have to understand it. We have to know it closely. We have to know the intended meaning that Allah wanted from us. Quran was revealed in Arabic. It has to be understood in Arabic. That is the original language of the Quran. If we cannot, then we have to have a second means, which is the translation of the meaning, not a translation of the glorious Quran directly, because no language can express fully the translation and would be equal to the original language. That is not possible because the glorious Quran, as I said, was contained in this form, was given in this style, and these culture boundaries or the constraints of the styling and the expressions in one language would be different from another and would not convey the true and full meaning. You have to explain all the time what the meaning is, although the translation at times would help us understand the meaning of the original language or the intended, although it was left open. Sometimes any particular expression was left open so that we can understand from it different things and various matters that were given to us in the glorious Quran. First, if we need to ponder upon the Quran and to understand the real meaning, we have to go back to the books of tafsir. Now the books of tafsir are of different types. Some of them concentrate on the words, the lexical meaning of the word. And we can understand what a word would mean, particularly like a qur'a, is it like hayb, and so on and so forth, which is part of the glorious Qur'an. And it may have a different meaning depending on the context and the connotation of the word. This is important. Secondly, there are some tafsirs or interpretations of the glorious Qur'an which concentrate on the general meaning and mostly will support this with interpreting a particular verse by another verse if it is found in the glorious Qur'an. Now that's, of course, the best thing to do is to interpret the glorious Qur'an with the glorious Qur'an. And secondly, to interpret the glorious Qur'an with the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Then thirdly, you interpret it with the sayings of the companions. And fourthly, is the sayings of a tabi'een and the scholars and so on. And fourthly, and which is the most dangerous, is to interpret it with one's opinion. Now, one's opinion would not be of value unless it goes with the meaning, the original meaning, and would be suitable and acceptable by Arabic language because it was revealed in that language. Now, when I say contemplation, I don't mean that you go ahead and interpret it the way you want, but rather you benefit from it and try to reflect on your situation as an individual and try to reflect on the matters of your own community and the situation in the whole world and the current affairs where there are interactions and dealings among people, we will bring what we understand from the glorious Quran to shed some light on what is taking place. And some people may be deceived by certain things in this life and they will not understand the meaning unless they go back to the Quran and say, oh, it is found here 
in the glorious Quran, and I was not able to see it. That's what I mean by this contemplation. Also, you have to have a good and valid and authentic source. Now, there are, alhamdulillah, tafsirs and interpretations that have been written long time ago, and there are some recent ones that were written by people in our current era, whether they have died or they're still living. But we can get the most from the earlier books, especially Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah, who is the father of all the interpreters of the glorious Quran, Al-Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, also who gave us the great Tafsir al-Quran al-Azim, and there are many other ones, Al-Imam Abdurrahman ibn Sa'di, rahimahullah, also interpreted the glorious Quran, Al-Jalalain, Jalaluddin al-Suyuti, and another Jalaluddin who gave us also the two tafsirs together put in one volume where they would only give you a slight and a short direct meaning. All these are important. We have a tafsir al-Muyassar, which is the easy or the made easy tafsir, which was produced by the Ministry of Islamic Affairs in Saudi Arabia, and some other books that have been revealed of tafsir and given out. MashaAllah, I can see Fath al-Qadir by al-Imam al-Shawkani and tafsir al-Muhit, al-Tafsir al-Munir, and so on and so forth. What we need to know and to learn is that we have to depend on tafsirs that have the evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the Salaf, the earlier predecessors. That is where the understanding of these verses came from because obviously the Prophet ﷺ understood the glorious Quran. He gave the interpretation to the glorious Quran, passed it on to companions. The companions also did convey some of the meanings based on what they heard from the Prophet ﷺ. At Tabi'un, those who were in contact with the Sahabis also gave us what they heard. Tabi'u Tabi'in, and those who heard from the predecessors who were in contact with the companions. Now, these are the ones that we need to depend on if they had these authentic evidences because later on, as you know, certain books, certain sayings were attributed to these generations which they did not say, which they did not report. And obviously it was made up by people who came in later because the changes and the problems of being affected by the non-Muslim civilizations and the non-Muslim cultures took place after probably around the first century. And then after that, we have new generations who were not purely educated in the book and the Sunnah purely. That is where we had this Greek influence, the Roman influence and the Persian influence over the Islamic sciences. What I need to concentrate on is to understand that, alhamdulillah, take it from an authentic source. If we have that, then obviously just think about the Quran itself when it addresses, because it's so pure and clear that when the Quran says, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, praise be to Allah, the Rabb of the universes. Now thinking about the worlds, there is a world of humans, the world of jinn, the world of animals, the world of birds, the world of heavens, the world of what is beneath us and under the earth, the world of those who passed before us. So, Allahu Rabbul Alameen, think of the immensity of the power of this Rabb, the one who actually brings up people with his own favors. That is the meaning of Rabb, not just only a Lord, but rather 
it is a word beyond that. So just think of that. And alhamd, what is the difference between alhamd and al-shukr? Of course, that is the function of tafsir to give us the meaning because praise is different than thankfulness. And praise is more comprehensive than that and more higher in status and submission to the one you're praising. So when you say, praise be to Allah, the Rabb of the universes, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. What is the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? Although they are two attributes to names coming from the same origin. Well, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the compassionate, the merciful, Subhanallah. Rahman within himself, Rahim for others, and so on and so forth. If we know the tafsir, it will expand our meaning. It will just, not only we read words, but rather we read words that are carrying beautiful and immense meanings that will make us think big and think of the expansion of the power of the glorious Quran and what it contains in there, Maliki Yawmiddin, and so on and so forth, the owner of the Day of Judgment. Why is he the owner of the Day of Judgment when he is the owner of everything? Well, that should bring the importance of the Day of Judgment to our minds where no one would claim, would be able even to raise a word or to say, I am the king, I am of some value, I am of some importance. No one would say that on the Day of Judgment. So these are things that we need to understand and do. And I need to continue with you after a short break. So please, be with us. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Back with you, continuing with the contemplation over the glorious Quran. And I'd like to give you the importance of when we think of the injunctions of the Quran, the prohibitions of the Quran, that if we are put in the position that they are addressing us directly, then it will have a great influence upon ourselves. When you hear, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, then you are addressed with that. When you hear, Inna ladhina kafaru, then you have to be warned that this action by these people who are rejectful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously needs to be avoided. Inna ladhina kafaru, yunadawna la maqtullahi akbaru min maqtikum anfusakum. They will be called upon on the Day of Judgment and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have no respect for them whatsoever even and he will put them to humiliation and to a very, very low status that even themselves have not put them that because when they see in the Day of Judgment the result of what they used to do in this dunya, they wish they could be brought back again to this life to believe in Allah and to be higher in status. So they feel so humiliated on the Day of Judgment, but even the humiliation of Allah is greater than that. So that is, look at this, if we think about this and think that everything that is addressed in the glorious Quran, we are meant by every address in the Quran, by every verse, and think where we are from this. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul, wa uli al-amri minkum, fa in tanaza'atum fi shayin farudduhu ila Allah wa Rasuli, in kuntum tu'minuna billahi wal yawm al-akhir, thalika khayru wa ahsanu ta'wila. O ye who believe, obey Allah, obey His Messenger, and those who have authority among you. Now that is important. How did the Quran say it? Ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Didn't say, Ati'u Allah wa Rasul, because there is an emphasis on the obedience of Allah, and then an emphasis on the obedience of the Messenger, and 
ulil amri minkum. There is an emphasis upon them as long as it belongs and is in pursuit of following and obeying what Allah says and what His Messenger says. You see, that is based on contemplation. If you read it so fast, you will not get the meaning. That's why we need to have two, for example, readings. In fact, some scholars are saying you may have even three. One is for general reciting to get rewards and to get accustomed to the glorious Quran and be always in contact with the glorious Quran, which is a good reading, but not so pondering that stop at every ayah you think about it, but rather you read, of course you read, enriching your soul, just like when you're saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alif Lam Meem, Thalika Al Kitab, La Rayba Fihi Hudan Lil Muttaqeen, Alladheena Yu'minuna Bil Ghaybi Wa Yuqeemuna Al Salata Wa Mimma Razaqnahum Yunfiqoon, that's just a normal reading. But if you are having another one to memorize, that's another reading to memorize. It could be like two or three verses a day. It's enough for a normal Muslim who's not a student of knowledge, who's not specializing in the Sharia sciences, could only do this two or three verses a day with a period to review this and to understand, mashallah, it will bring benefit. And then again, two or three ayahs to ponder upon every day. Just think about, for example, the ayahs we just recited from Surah Al-Baqarah. Alif, Lam, Mim. What does that mean? These are, of course, letters that the Surah started with. Allahu A'lam. Allah knows the best regarding its own the real meaning of that. However, some surahs started with this just to make you alert or to say that these are challenges. The Quran was made of these letters. So can you make a Quran like it? Of course, no one would be able to do so. And then said, ذَلِكَ kitab. After these huruf al muqatta as the Quran says, these just single letters, Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ You can read it, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ الْأَرَيْبِ This is the book, no doubt. Or you can say, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ This is the book, لا ريب فيه. There is no doubt in it. هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It's a guidance for those who have taqwa. Subhanallah. Just think about this. This book is no doubt. You know, this ayah, for example, made one person enter Islam. One person, when reading this particular ayah, in the beginning of the second surah in the glorious Quran, which is mainly after Al-Fatiha, and people think that Al-Baqarah is just, you know, after, it's just like the beginning. He was thinking that if Allah says this, if the Quran says this about itself, then obviously it must be coming from a very powerful source. Because no one would claim that this is the book, no doubt. Normally people would say, well, this is my humble effort when I wrote this book, and I hope that you'll like it, I hope this will be of benefit to you, and so on and so forth. Now the Quran doesn't say that. The Quran says, this is the book, no doubt. لا ريب فيه. للمتقين. And it is a guidance for those who attain taqwa, subhanallah. I mean, you can just spend a long period of time, a whole day even, just thinking about this. The Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim used a time to repeat one ayah overnight in their own prayers or outside their prayers, just thinking. Just like the Prophet one night in his own prayer kept repeating, In tu'adhibhum fa inna hum ibadu, wa in taghfir lahum fa inna ka anta al-azizul hakim. This is the saying of Isa alayhi salam, In tu'adhibhum fa inna hum ibadu. If you punish them, they are your servants, they are your slaves. And if you forgive them, you are Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. You are the honorable, you are the wise, 
you have the power over everything, you have your own judgment, your own decision, your own might and dignity and honor. Obviously, Subhanallah al -Azim. Just he kept repeating this because he says, Subhanallah, this is what we need. This is what we need. In to it's up to you, O Allah. And normally, because these are people who are violating. Prophet ﷺ was thinking about his own ummah, that if they reject, they would be punished. But Ya Allah, forgive them, because you are the mighty, you are the wise, you have your own wisdom. Just thinking about all these meanings, subhanallah, yes, it brings so many things into you and will open for you some reflections that would not have been possible if you were to do this with just a normal reading like many Muslims would do. You hear them reading and repeating and repeating the same thing. They will not get the benefit of contemplation, just like if they have one khatma or one complete reading of the whole Quran from beginning till the end. Yes, they may not understand. And that's why they need to put some books of tafsir just around them in case, or just read from a book of tafsir with the Quran inside. Now that's Alhamdulillah made available, where you have the Quranic text inside in the middle and the Quranic interpretations of the verses around them. So in case you don't understand a particular meaning, you go to that and that will give you the full meaning. Of course, the last thing I'd like to address is to have a trust in the glorious Quran. Don't put your own judgment over things and try to get the help from the Quran to support that prejudgment on your side. Until then, I leave you with Allah's care and protection. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, my God.